Well, missed you. Good evening and welcome to this, the final of our Lenten services on Wednesday evening. Pleasure to see you here. Trust that you've had a good week and that this is a, a fine uh, fitting for the end of our Lenten services in the middle of Holy Week. Just a few announcements. Uh, you'll notice on the right-hand side of your page there, uh, tomorrow at 7 p.m. we have Monday Thursday service. Uh, Friday at noon, the Good Friday service. Uh, Saturday, Temple Shurvikta is, um, Tikva is having a Seder meal, and you'll see that announcement at the bottom of the left side of your page. And then on Easter Sunday, there's a full schedule starting at uh, 8 o'clock in the morning with Easter sunrise service. Then 8.30 we have breakfast, and it's always a great time of fellowship. 10 o'clock, our regular Easter worship service, and then a fellowship hour, and then an Easter egg hunt for the children. So I'm sure it'll be a full day and a, a fitting conclusion to our time of, of working up to the death and the resurrection of our wonderful Savior. A time that we've had for uh, thinking about ourselves and our shortcomings and how God has met all of our needs and how his glorious resurrection gives us assurance of eternal life. Let us pray. Gracious God, we are thankful for this opportunity tonight to uh, come into your presence, to remind ourselves of who we are and who you are, and what you've done for us in bringing us to yourself. We worship you, Father, in spirit and in truth, and we ask that your blessing might be upon this people, that our hearts might be thrilled as we uh, look at what you've done for us and realize the ramifications in the wonderful salvation that's provided for us in Jesus Christ. In his name we do pray. Amen. The call to worship comes from Isaiah chapter 53, verses uh, 2 through 5. This is the uh, suffering servant. He grew up before him like a tender shoot, and like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and familiar with suffering, like one from whom men hide their faces. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he took up our infirmities and carried our sorrows, yet we considered him stricken by God, smitten by him, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. This is God's word for the people of God. Glory be to God. Our first hymn is number 379, My Hope is Built on Nothing Less. This is one of the old favorites of the church, very fitting for this time of year. You may remain seated as we sing, 379.
from our booklet today, in case you haven't read it, says this, and it's entitled, Victory. It has become almost proverbial to speak of someone who snatched victory from the jaws of defeat, a person who seemed certain to be a loser, but then won anyway. Likewise, it has become sarcastic to turn that phrase around and speak of someone who managed to snatch defeat from the jaws of victory, one who looked like a sure winner before bungling it at the last minute. The latter seems to be the opinion that many people held, and some still hold, about the crucified Christ. Things were going so well for him. It's a shame he had to ruin it by dying like that. In the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, Excuse me, if the crucifixion of Jesus Christ is his final glorious triumphant act, what is so triumphant about it? Did he unfortunately snatch defeat from the jaws of victory, or did he precisely by dying like that actually snatch victory from the jaws of defeat? Well, that's what we're going to talk about tonight in the sermon that I have entitled, Forgiveness. <clears throat> the subtitle of this sermon is uh, Substitutionary Atonement. Forgiveness, forgive, you know that word. You know the word substitute, that's something in place of something else. But do you understand the word to atone? or atonement. The teaching of substitutionary atonement is a major doctrine in Christianity, which is the only religion that has such a teaching. That is for at least a human, substituting for a human. There are many religions that sacrifice animals in place of humans. The Israelis were one, the Jewish nation, uh, Muslim nations also sacrifice animals, as do uh, lots of tribes in, uh, in different places. But uh, Christianity is the only religion that I'm aware of where uh, a person is substituted another person to take away their sin. It is a fact that humanity owed a debt to God that it could not pay. So God offered a substitute to pay the debt for us. The debt was, of course, disobedience to the Creator God's wishes and commands for His creation. Humanity did not live up to or follow what God created us for. But because He loved His creation so much, 
Rather than destroy it, he made a plan to redeem it. To redeem means to buy something back that you once owned, and for some reason it was no longer in your possession. It also means to pay the price to free someone who has been enslaved. It's been used that way as well. Both definitions fit humanity's sin debt owed to God. God made us, but we left the one to whom we once belonged. We were enslaved to the passions of self and of this world, but God paid the redemptive price to bring us out of the slave market of sin and back to himself as his very own children. And how marvelous is that? How did he do this? The Bible says that the wages of sin is death. Someone had to die. If we didn't die for ourselves, someone had to die in our place. The Bible teaches that Jesus washed us from our sins in his own blood. His death on the cross was not for himself, but for all humanity. As sinless man, he did not have to die for himself. So his death became the substitute for ours. And in terms of our title tonight, Jesus atoned for our sins. Everyone who claims to be a follower of God does not believe that the shedding of Jesus' blood can wash away sin. Reverend John Shelby Spawn is or was the presiding Episcopal, Episcopal bishop for the city of Newark, New Jersey. Spong said in a book he wrote, entitled The Sins of Scripture, that God's part in allowing Jesus to die on the cross was a cruel act of divine child abuse. And that the whole idea of Jesus' blood that is so rich in the hymnody of the Christian church, the evangelical part of the Christian church, that it was just awful for people to talk that way or think that way. A cruel act of divine child abuse. The famous, uh, or rather infamous, agnostic Robert Ingersoll in his lecture on gods said this, What man can believe that blood can appease God? And yet our entire system of religion is based upon that belief. The Jews pacified Jehovah with the blood of animals, and according to the Christian system, the blood of Jesus softened the heart of God a little and rendered possible the salvation of a fortunate few. It is hard to conceive how the human mind can give assent to such terrible ideas. I have heard others when referring to the death of Christ as atonement for our sins, as a slaughterhouse religion. Just, just awful to think that God would kill a person in order to take away sins. <clears throat> Yet the Bible does promote the blood of Jesus for our atonement. Those who think why, like those who think otherwise really have never studied the scriptures. And if they read it at all, they didn't believe what it said. Many people in our own denomination, those on the liberal left side of our clergy, some do not believe in the atonement of Christ, some do not even believe in the deity of Christ, some do not even believe in the resurrection of Christ. And that's astonishing to call yourself a Christian or a Presbyterian and not to hold those very standard uh, doctrines. I heard of a woman who was uh, preaching for or auditioning for a pulpit. Uh, it was in our state. And the pulpit committee asked her, uh, well, what do you believe about the deity of Christ? And she said, well, I haven't made up my mind about that yet. She didn't get the job. Here are some scriptures that talk about the deity of Christ, the blood of Christ, the salvation of our souls. John, 
in the first chapter of Revelation said this, John to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace be unto you and peace from him which is and which was and which is to come, and from the seven spirits which are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood, and has made us kings and priests unto God and his Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. The words of the Apostle John. The Apostle Paul said an awful lot about the blood of Christ and redemption. To the church at Colossae he wrote, For it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell, speaking of Christ. And having made peace through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things unto himself, by him I say, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven, made peace through the blood of his cross. And then again to the church at Ephesus, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace, wherein he has abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence, that we should be to the praise of his glory, who first trusted in Christ. And again Paul to the Roman said this, for when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet peradventure for a good man some would even dare to die. But God commended his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. The teaching of blood sacrifices to cover sin began with the exodus of the children of evil, the children of Israel from Egypt, who was the nation of God, the nation of Israel. Passover is still celebrated without killing an animal by Jews to remember their freedom from slavery that God gave them through Moses. The story is recorded in Exodus chapter 12, if you'd like to read that, where God promised, when I see the blood, I will pass over you and only slay the unbelievers. Blood sacrifices to cover sin continued in the law of Moses, which we now understand were signposts pointing to Jesus, God's very own Son, whose self-sacrifice was to put away all sin for all people for all time. Remember John the Baptist in John chapter 1 verse 29 said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And the word sin there is singular. Not necessarily the sins of the world, but sin, the very sin nature that we receive from Adam. The New Testament continues the tradition of blood sacrifice, but also says it ends with the sacrifice of Christ. Listen to these verses from the Bible. Romans chapter 6, verse 10. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life he lives, he lives to God. And Hebrews 7.27 He has no need, like those high priests, to offer sacrifices daily, first for his own sins and then for those of the people, since he did this once for all when he offered up himself. And in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 12, He entered once for all into the holy places, not made by means, excuse me, he entered once for all into the holy places, not by means of the blood of goats and calves, but by means of his own blood, thus securing an eternal redemption. The same chapter in verse 26. For then he would have had to suffer repeatedly since the foundation of the world. But as it is, 
He has appeared once for all at the end of the ages to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And Hebrews 10.10 10, For by, by that will we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Peter suggests that this knowledge of God in Christ dying for us should be the motivating factor for us to love God and to live a life dedicated to righteousness, holy living, because God so loved us that he gave his only son to die that we might live. This is what Peter said. And if you call on the Father, Pass the time of your sojourning here in fear. For as much as ye know that you were not redeemed with cor corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot, who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you, who by him do believe in God that raised him up from the dead and gave him glory that your faith and hope might be in God. Some time ago, probably over a hundred years ago, Fanny Crosby wrote a hymn uh, based on this doctrine of the blood of the Lamb. It's called Redeemed. And this is how it goes in the first verse. Redeemed, how I love to proclaim it. Redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Redeemed through His infinite mercy. His child and forever I am. We used to sing old hymns like that all the time in the church when I was young and growing up. It seems like somehow or other we've gotten away from singing about the blood of Christ, about salvation it's more now our songs are aimed at uh, being good and the goodness of God and even about uh, nature and things like that. But I sometimes wish we'd go back to the old hymns. Now in closing, let me say just a few things about forgiveness. Forgiveness presupposes guilt. I think that's obvious. But then I've been... I've been said, it's been said of me that I have a great gift. And that gift is elucidating the obvious. <laughs> telling people things they already know. But it seems obvious that forgiveness presumes guilt. If you have done nothing wrong, you do not need to be forgiven. Mankind, however, has disobeyed the Creator God's commands and we are guilty of breaking God's laws. That is sin, and humanity needed to be forgiven. Forgiveness also presumes repentance. If you haven't sinned, you don't need to repent. If you have sinned, you do. God's forgiveness is unique in that he offers to forgive guilty sinners even before they repent. That is the gospel of Jesus Christ that goes forth into the world, saying God is offering salvation. God is offering forgiveness even before we realize we need forgiveness. The Holy Spirit is calling sinners to repent and to believe in the Savior. That is part of the Holy Spirit's work in the, in the church. Oftentimes, we do not even know that we have offended God until we hear of God's offer of forgiveness. I think that was my case when I was a young man, about uh, 17 years of old, of age, when I uh, heard the gospel preached and responded to it. I didn't know I was bad. But this is the great mercy of God. Justice of God is stayed. Punishment is held back in hopes that the offender, us, will repent of our wrongdoing, that is our sin against God, and will accept God's provision for our salvation. The shed blood of His only Son, 
Jesus Christ. Humans forgive usually after someone admits they're wrong and asks for forgiveness. That's how God's forgiveness is unique. Uh, we get our back up when somebody does something wrong against us and we huff and puff and fellowship is broken and we can't do anything until they come and repent and say, I'm sorry, then we can forgive them. That's the way humans do it. God does it differently. But then forgiveness is based on love. If you don't care about somebody, you don't care what they do. You just pay no attention to them at all. They mean nothing. But God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son to atone for the sins of humanity. And you and I are in that group. Christ died for us. Forgiveness is based on love. Forgiveness also restores relationship or fellowship. When a person repents and forgiveness is given, then the animosity is taken away that kept him from enjoying each other's presence. You see this in families between husbands and wives who have a spat. Until somebody says, I'm sorry, they can't even stay in the same room. But somebody says, I'm sorry, and then they kiss and make up. That's human forgiveness. But God, in his mercy and in his grace, paid that awful price in order that we might be restored to fellowship with him. Now the fellowship between God and humanity was broken in the Garden of Eden. So all this time, these many thousands of years later, you and I come to know Christ as Savior and our fellowship with God is restored. What a shame it is that most Christians don't understand that and never really have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. They don't really know him as brother and friend. They just know him in the sacraments. Forgiveness restores fellowship and relationship. The price to be paid is repentance and cessation. Now here's a new word, cessation. After we confess our sins, knowing that we were guilty of wrong, we are now responsible to turn away from the sin and not do it anymore. So for repentance has the idea of turning around and going in the other direction. That's what the word repent means, to change your mind, to go in an opposite direction. If we really repent of our sins, we stop doing our sins. What was it Jesus said to the people that he healed and whose sins he forgave? Go and sin no more. This is hard for many people who are trapped in sinful behavior. But God has provided a way. Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, No temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. God is faithful, and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with the temptation, he will also provide the way to escape, that you may be able to endure it. Our situation is not unique. Everyone is tempted the same way. And it's not God that tempts us. Whatever the, wherever the temptation comes from, it doesn't come from God. But God our Father provides us a way of escape in all temptations. All people have problems with escaping temptations. The way to stop sin is to not look at the sin but to look for the escape hatch. Too often when temptation is before us, we keep looking at the temptation. Turn your eyes away from that. Look for the escape that God has provided. Now here's a rather harsh example, and it probably does not fit anybody here at all. Uh, so I'll use it. Supposing that your sin is drunkenness and you can't stop drinking, and you're sitting in a bar. 
What's the way of escape? The door. Leave the bar. <laughs> Go out the door. That's the door of escape. I've heard of others and true stories of people who have escaped temptation just by walking a different route. There's one fellow who was going to, it was either Wheaton College or Moody Bible Institute, I forget which, but he went to a counselor and confessed, I have these problems with my mind. I'm always thinking about uh, naked women, you know, and have these dirty thoughts in my mind. And the counselor in talking to him found out that every day he walked from home to school past this uh, burlesque theater that all, it had all these pictures out here. <laughs> he said, go a different way. And it helped the young man to get rid of his problem. Also, God's forgiveness is based on his justice. Sin had to be atoned for. That is, it had to be paid. There was a price. A price had to be paid. Sin was a debt humanity owed to God for disobedience. Christ paid the debt which was too high for any human to pay. No good works that we could do would satisfy God in the fact of our sin. Only God himself could pay the debt that we owed. That's mercy and grace and love. Since Christ died for all, then all can live through him if they will accept him. God can now forgive. It is indeed the blood of Jesus that makes forgiveness possible. And then forgiveness involves forgetting. When God forgives a sinner, he does not remember those sins anymore. The Bible says he casts them behind his back as far as the east is from the west. And God never remembers our sins anymore. That is something that is very important for every Christian to know, to understand, and to believe. That when we are forgiven by God, He forgets the sin. When we forgive one another, uh, we sometimes uh, don't forget those sins. So the idea is, when we forgive one another, we should never bring that sin or offense up again. If we do, we're never really forgiven. And finally, we must forgive ourselves. If God forgives us our sins, we have no right not to forgive ourselves. In fact, it's mandatory. Otherwise, we will be filled with guilt false guilt, because the sin is forgiven and forgotten, except by us. And if we don't forgive ourselves and forget that, then it will destroy our joy of salvation. It will steal that hope and that joy from us. The peace will be gone, because we will be forever condemning ourselves for something that God has already forgiven us for. Therefore, it is tremendously important that once God has forgiven us, we must forgive ourselves. Because of the blood of Jesus, believers in God's salvation can have fellowship with God in this life and be assured of eternal life with God when this life is ended. I say praise the Lord to that. And amen. amen. I offer you now a time of uh, quietness where you can uh, do your own uh, personal interview or with yourself or inventory. And for your time of prayer, if there is a sin in your life that needs to be done away with, repent of it, please. Get it out of the way and God will forgive and then forgive yourself. But if you have already repented of all known sin in your life, then use this time to rejoice in your salvation and praise God for sending His Son to die in your place. Here is something that is tremendously important. Once we have asked God's forgiveness for a sin and have stopped practicing it, I think it is something of an insult to continue to ask God's forgiveness for that sin. You understand what I'm saying? 
Once it's taken away, don't continually be confessing it and uh, asking for, for forgiveness. You're just bringing it up again when God has already forgotten it. And it means that you haven't forgiven yourself. So, in this time of quietness, if you need to repent, do so. And then, praise God. And thank Him. And be filled with the joy of your salvation as you realize that it was the blood of Christ that washed you free from your sins. As we have this quiet time, Michael is going to play something softly in the background just to kind of set a mood for us. Let us pray. Mm -hmm. for sending your son Jesus to bear the awful pain of the cross, the separation of the son from the father because you could not look upon our sins as they were placed upon him, the awful agony of body and spirit that he suffered in those hours on the cross. Thank you for his willingness to be our sacrifice and for his blood that cleanses us from all our sins. We praise your name, Father, and we thank you tonight for this group and for this church and for its wonderful ministry in this community. And we take a moment, Father, to pray for those on our prayer list, for uh, Beth Bremer, for Jeannie Cole, for Hilda Dyer, for Lena L. Isa, for Gail Moore, for Kathleen Olds, for Bud Wyman, who is now home. We thank you for his coming home. And for Ralph and Ruth Young, who have recently gone to the nursing home. But there is a possibility that they might be returned, Father. So help them in this, that they might gain strength and wisdom and understanding and ability uh, to be returned to their former life and to their worship in the church. All of this we pray in the name of Jesus Christ and according to your perfect will for them and for us. And we make our prayer tonight in Jesus' blessed name. Amen. Amen. Our closing hymn is number 485. A hymn of worship, a hymn of praise, to God be the glory. Let's stand as we sing this closing hymn, please. 485.
love you because you have loved us first. We worship you and we praise you and we thank you for all you've done. Throughout all eternity, we shall be with you and praising you and living a life that you've ordained for us. And so once again, we give you our thanks and our praise, especially in this holy week upon which we have uh, so focused our attention and our lives. We pray your blessing now in the continuing services of this week. May Jesus Christ be praised, we ask in his name. Amen. Thank you for coming. Go in peace.